Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Mellow morning, I should say. Good morning. Take a couple of minutes and say good morning to everybody. There, Michael Allen just does it all in one big shot. Hi, Niffy. Good morning. I love seeing you guys say good morning to each other. It's probably my best part of the day. Just this, watching you guys. It's almost like a mush fest. Giving hugs. Good morning. We're gonna learn a couple of things as groups today. Jesus Christ, you're a piece of work. A good piece, though. Thank you for being here, you freaking goofball. I love our bird. I'm embarrassed because somebody sent that to me a month or so ago, and I forget who. I want to thank them. But I can't remember who sent it. Isn't that adorable? I love it. It sits in my, uh, right behind me in the uh, office here. No, sh no snow, Sharon. No, no snow. Getting ready for Monday. Totality. How do you like the music? The music okay for right now? We went with a uh, straight piano work this morning. whiskey. You're going to have a great time, Badgie. I got to head north again right after the show, heading to uh, Alpina. Okay, I want you guys to, there's enough of you here now, 53 people, 23 likes. Pop another like or two up there, if you would. Pop another like or two. Can we get to at least 50%? Yeah, Penny, it's looking worse. Here we go. I want you guys to pay just a little bit of attention to this. Day Albert Einstein was teaching a class and wrote on the board nine times one. One day, Einstein's teaching a class. Day Albert Einstein was teaching a class and wrote on the board nine times one equals nine, nine times two equals 18. And he continued all the way up to nine times 10 equals 91. The class broke out in laughter because Einstein made a mistake. The correct answer to nine times 10 is obviously 90, not 91. And the students began to make fun of him. Einstein waited for everyone to be silent and then said, despite the fact that I analyzed nine problems correctly, no one congratulated me, but when I made one mistake, everyone started laughing. This means that even if a person is successful, society will notice even the slightest mistake. So, today's reminder to you is that mistakes are a part of the process. 
As Einstein once said, the only person who never makes a mistake is someone who does nothing. One day, Albert Einstein was teaching a class and wrote on... Boop! How can you disagree with that? How can you disagree with that? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I don't disagree. I find I make my mistakes when I'm when I'm doing things. It's actually a mistake for me to lay on a couch too for too long. That's kind of a mistake. <clears throat> I know a person who's a perfectionist. I mean, this young lady is a perfectionist. Um, to the word, I mean crazy perfectionist she wants to start a business it's like great idea she's bouncing ideas off me i said you're brilliant you can make this happen two years two years now <laughs> yeah thank you Melissa G. two years now she's been writing her business proposal i'm like talk to her How's it going? Oh, I'm still working. It's not perfect yet. I can't propose. I can't send it to anybody because it's not perfect yet. Her idea is getting old. I can tell you. I don't want to tell her that. When she asks, I'll tell her. I think your idea is getting that business idea you had. There's about eighty thousand people doing it now. Your idea got old. Your idea got old while you sat around and tried to be perfect. So that's a that's something we got to look out for. Uh, today, well, let's do this. Let me give something away to never winner reporters. I had a good time yesterday. Seventy five people here, thirty nine likes. I wonder if I should go on strike. I wonder if I should go on strike. I don't ask for a lot here. I'm getting a lag. I'm getting a lag on my end. Mine is actually going off and on. Sean P, the whole thing's crazy, isn't it? Did you push the like button? Uh, the reason for likes here, Sean P, is because we found out that YouTube's, what do they call it, algorithm, sends our feed out to more people if there's more likes. So that's the reason. Never winner befores. Are there any here? I'd like to give something away to never winner befores. Only if you're never winner before. Okay, thank you, Pilar. Only never winner before, okay? Here we go. Only winner, never winner befores. Sean P says, well, what are you guys about? Stick around. We're about love, learning, and laughing. <laughs> okay. Never winner befores. Southern Green's already ahead of all of you. You're going to put three numbers between 1 and 50 on your screen line. The first person to get the number that's in my shoot is going to win a prize from me, but only if you're a never winner before. So put three numbers on your screen and you can do it over and over till you get it. So far, the only person, I'm, uh, Jason, I'm not sure. I might have sent you something, huh? I think I have, but we'll figure it out. I only want never winner before someone that's never won anything here before. Okay, I want them to experience that the fun. Because it's fun! <laughs> Never winner befores. There are not very many of you here. Keep throwing some numbers at me. I have not seen the number yet. Never winner befores. Now Sean's in the game. Good job, Sean. Okay, I mean like never, never, Badgie. Never, never. Okay? We could do the last few months later, but never, ever, ever, never, ever. Brett, you could put three up to three numbers on your line. So far, nobody's got it. 
So if I'm watching my screen and on my screen, nobody's got the number that's in the shoot. Okay? I'm going to keep it going until somebody gets it. Never winner before. Is there a reason you guys have never won before? <laughs> okay. The first time I won, I was a never winner before. That makes so much sense, Niffy. That's that's beautiful. That's that's sensible. Never winner before. Is anybody going to get it? So far, Southern Green has said every number between 1 and 50 except for three of them. Okay? <laughs> Good job. Never a winner before. I was a never winner before until I won. Brett Williams! Brett Williams! Brett Williams! Brett Williams sing shoots a single shot and scores. Brett, one number on the line and he scores. Brett Williams! Ding! Good job, Brett. I'm glad to see you here. And this is going to be fun to send you. Where's my... Here it is. Brett Williams. Good job, Brett. We're going to do that again tomorrow. Never won her before. If you've never won before... You're going to get a chance to be in your own little category of never winner befores and try to win. Brett, I need you to send your address to me at this, at this website, the DetroitMushLab.net. If you go to this website, scroll to the bottom, there's a little email there. Hit that email and send me your address. When you do that, I print out a label and I send it back to you with Brett. This weighs a little over four grams, okay? This weighs a little over four grams. We're gonna send that to, to Brett, okay? Right, it's a, it's a, it's all thicky. And if you send me your address, I need your address within 24 hours. If I don't get your address within 24 hours, that goes back in the pile. Okay, so you can do that. A quick little. Here's send it to him. Thank you. And we'll get that sent to you. All right, go send it now, Brett. That's a good idea. I'm going to bust two or three myths, and then I'm going to have a little class on something that you guys weren't expecting. And then, well, we'll find out what's next. I was watching um, TV. I, I don't really watch TV unless it's sports. I don't watch a lot of TV. TV watches me. Does, do you, does anybody know what I mean by that? TV actually watches me. 90% of the time I'm reading, but I have an ear. And then if something sounds like, oh, then I'll look up to the screen. But 90% of the time I'm inputting from from me, I mean, I'm reading, and the TV's watching me, it's all background noise, SSW, okay? <clears throat> so sometimes I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm uh, reading, which is for me research usually, because 90% of what I read is, is um, historic, is nonfiction stuff. Scientific nowadays. I think I'm getting more scientific. <clears throat> and um, the just crazy statistics about cancer. It just came flowing across the TV information. One out of five adults are gonna end up with cancer of some form or another. They did this map, map of the world, colored zones. 
It was the craziest thing. There's a whole green area. It was all Northern, North America, South America, some of the islands around there, all of that. The number one um, reason that um, men are dying in that zone. What do you think the, what do you think it is? What do you think it is? That number one um, cancer. SSW is right. SSW is right. Prostate cancer. Prostate. And then weirdly enough, you look over on this map and Asia and a little bit of Europe is all a totally different color. A color coded to <clears throat> in Asia and in Europe area, the number one reason that they're dying men is not prostate. They're not having nearly the prostate issues that are the North America, South America is. What do you think the number one reason is? What do you think it is? Over in the Asian area, Europe. Justin said it, lung, lung cancer. We have these two big, and it's literally, it was, what struck me about this was how it's almost geographically divided. All of this one kind of cancer over here and another kind of cancer over here and very um, impacted. Made me start thinking about is, how much of that has to do with our diet, the Westerners? I don't know. I really don't. There's a myth. There's a myth that says cancer is a single disease. We say cancer, we just think, oh, cancer. Cancer is a term. Cancer is a term for over 200 diseases that all act the same way. 200. There's uh, over 200 different kinds of, and we can think, we basically focus on three or four. Over 200 different kinds of diseases. They all require different forms of treatment. So there can never be one cure for cancer. Cure cancer. Well, which one? So it gives me a lot of gratitude. How about this one? We all know this. Everybody knows this, right? That when you sneeze, your heart stops for like a second. Right? Busto. I'm sorry to hear that, Tim. And good job. Keep it up. When you sneeze, your heart stops for a second. I've heard that all my life, and I've always, oh, no, hold on. Sneezing is a reflex that's sent from your brain. And it tickles something in your upper lining of your nose. What happens is that the nerve sends a signal to your brain when you sneeze. However, this doesn't stop your heart. Okay, I'm glad. I didn't want sneezing to stop my heart. Tim, you'll be in our thoughts. Hang in here with us. CCS, that's a good question. I don't know. Okay? <laughs> All my life, I've thought if I sneeze, I might die. No, it's just a brain to a nerve. Boom, boom. And they're just doing their thing. Leroy, we haven't seen you in a minute. Good morning. 
cold showers. Cold showers. Jesus Christ knows this one. Probably better than most Australians. Jesus Christ should know this one pretty well. Okay? Yeah, rude boy, you definitely are rude, aren't you? He starts out by saying, hey, Grandpa, did you fight in World War II? I'm not sure if you're talking to me, so I'll ignore it, rude boy. Cold showers can help sober people up. Jesus Christ in Australia knows better. Drinking alcohol lowers the body's core body temperature. So we drink alcohol and we're actually lowering our core body temperature. And a cold shower simply puts a person at risk for hypothermia. The only thing that can sober a person up is time and rest. You know, every single movie I've ever seen, when they want you to, like, when they want you to, like, not be drunk anymore, they throw you in the shower. Why don't you just throw me into the hypothermia bin? What? Heart attacks. <clears throat> what, Pops, what's wrong with you this morning? I'm doing all this negative stuff. It's not negative. This is stuff we need to know. Okay, sometimes it's not the most positive subject, but it's important information. Okay, right, Kim? Throw them a little coffee and now they're just an agitated drunk. <laughs> How about this one? Heart attacks hurt. Well, I expect when I get a heart attack, it's gonna hurt. I've always thought, oh, look out, Amelia, I'm coming home. Who did that? Fred Sanford? What was what was Fred Sanford's wife's name that he was always trying to come home to? Do you guys remember that? Sanford and Son? I'm coming home. What was her name? Somebody help me out with the ladies, his wife's. Elizabeth! <laughs> you guys are so smart. <laughs> How come everybody knew immediately? Everybody was, I'm coming home, Elizabeth. That was a good show. <laughs> do you guys, do you guys run in a junkyard? Okay. Heart attacks hurt. I'm coming home, happy dirt dude. Sanford and Son. We gotta watch one of those at Mush Fest. At Mush Fest, let's run some, give me 10 people. I need 10 people to agree, even if you're not going to be there. Give me at least 10 people that say, let's run some oldies but goodies at Mush Fest. Background TV. Come on. Andy Griffith, Ozzie and Harriet, The Rifleman. <laughs> Memorial Weekend is what it is. Too, too much. In the heat of the night, oh, Kim, you're killing me. That's a good one. Let's do some oldies. Last Mush Fest, or the one before that, I saw the Red Green Show. Bill D. I saw the Red Green, Beverly Hillbillies. That would be good. Mr. The Red Skeleton. That was my dad's favorite show. <laughs> what was his name? Um, Clem Cadiddlehopper. Remember Clem Cadiddlehopper. You guys are crazy. Look at all these names, all these things you're coming up with. Gilligan's Island, and we all watch Marianne. Okay, Benny Hill. I couldn't get into Benny Hill, Wes. I couldn't. Okay, Mannix. Mannix was the man. And let's not forget that Mannix was a little advanced. He had an interracial secretary working for him, right? Mannix was like way ahead of his time. Okay, taxi. You guys are coming up with some great shows here. Exception, I love Leave it to Beaver. Have gun, will travel. You guys are killing it here. You guys have got to be there. Okay, 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 okay. My name is Kim Clum Cuttilop. Sea Hunt. Tim. Tim, where have you been all my life? Flipper. Flipper. How about Flipper? Um, how about, um... 
Oh my gosh, now which one? Oh gosh, see that's a good one. That's a really good one, Flipper. How about this one, Big Ben? Or no, General Ben. General Ben. General Ben, remember they had a, they had a, they had a um, bear. They kept a bear. Mikhail's Navy was good. Bewitched. Million dollar, you guys. This was, this turned out to be a whole lot of fun. <laughs> oh my goodness. I dream of Genie. Oh, I dreamt of Genie, SSW. I'm not even gonna lie, okay? But I also dreamt of, what's her name? Mrs. Brady. You know, Florence Henderson. I look back and I'm like, I'm not back then, I'm like, oh, <laughs> Florence is a hot mom.com. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what was wrong with me. Okay. <laughs> oh, Woody, that belly button. Oh, okay. Oh, what was the other one? The one with Johnny Depp. What was the one? The, the Johnny Depp one. Jump Street. Jump Street? The Partridge Family. Andrew Griffith Show. Chips. Chips was filmed in our backyard. We could, you could go down and, and watch them film chips. Yep. <laughs> 21st, 21 Jump Street. You were cool if you watched 21 Jump Street. You were cool. And only Baywatch with Pam Anderson, I agree. After that, it got a little, nope, she had to be there. Okay, Dragnet. Okay, we're going to get serious now. We were serious. We were talking about serious diseases. And the next thing you know, we're back in the 1960s, 70s. Oh, in living color. In living color is so good. Fireman Bill. <laughs> Fireman Bill. <laughs> How do you do Fireman Bill? Quick, quick. My brother can do Fireman Bill so perfectly. What you doing there? <laughs> Let me tell you something. That's it. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Remember that? Let me tell you something. He burned the whole house down. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Fireman Bill. Okay, okay. I, I was supposed to be teaching today. Heart attacks hurt. Homie, don't play that. Ava loves the old shows. Oh, gosh. <clears throat> that was a good show. Heart attacks hurt. Heart attacks will rarely hurt. And 60% of them go completely unnoticed. If they do hurt, it usually comes in the form of a heartburn, a toothache, never heard that one, or just a strange feeling in your chest. Some heart attacks can even last hours before any symptoms arise. Those are usually the most fatal. You could be sitting around having heart attacks and you don't even know it, Kim. 60% of the time. You, we could have had a whole history of heart attacks and don't even know it. That freaks me out. I'm gonna do two or three more myths and then we're gonna teach you guys something. Well, this is all teaching too. Okay, Ponderosa, yeah, no, not Ponderosa, what was it called? Um, the Big Valley? No, Big Valley was good, but Bonanza, Bonanza. My favorite was Hoss. I always kind of felt sorry for Hoss, okay? I always felt sort of sorry for him. And if you look at it, there's a couple of pictures. Am I Lauren Green? If I didn't have this, if I'm just like that, I'm getting pretty close to Lauren Green. Oh no! <laughs> oh geez. 23, Katie, that's so young. I'm Jim Ma, yeah, I'm very close. Okay. <laughs> if you've swallowed poison, you should. Thank you, dancer. If you've swallowed poison, you should vomit. Most poisons are acidic or alkaline. And since your stomach produces its own acid, it might be able to deal with it better than your throat or lungs. 
wood after you vomit. It just stays in there and percolates. Depends on the poison. How about this one? I'm going to give you two or three more. Organic food. Organic food is more nutritious. Automatic, right? That's, I mean, come on. They got health food stores everywhere. That food's more nutritious there. Right? Timmy's going, Tim's going to hell no, Pops. Katie, I hate to bust the myth, but guess what? What makes a difference in nutrients, the nutrition, nutrient food, organic, non-organic, which makes one more nutritious than the other? The amount of time it spends on the shelf at the grocery store. It's how long a certain product sits on the shelf at a grocery store and not if it's organic or not. For example, spinach loses about half of its foliate within a week. Organic spinach, I've been sitting here a week. Non-organic spinach, I've been sitting here three days. You're going to pick up the non-organic. That whole organic thing, I, I have my own opinions. I'm not going to go there. Organic food tastes better. Is that true, Mr. McFeely? Does organic food taste better than non-organic food? I mean, I'm paying more for it. I'm now finding out it's not as it's equally nutritious, but at least it should taste better, right, Vegas? Some of you're going it's gonna taste worse. Organic food tastes better. <laughs> Multiple studies have done blind test taste tests on organic and non-organic food. So now we're taste testing. I'm bringing in a bunch of people, blind test. Organic, non-organic. They found that people can't tell the difference if the food is organic or not. <laughs> the only difference people can taste is if the food has been produced locally or has been imported. Imported food tends to have spent a long time in transit. Thus, it gives off a staler taste. That's good, Streety. And Vegas is right. How about that? I'm learning all kinds of stuff about organic food. How about this? You don't have to be careful about washing organic food. All products, no matter if they're organic or not, are susceptible to bacteria. Everything that's bought at a store or grown in your backyard should be washed thoroughly underwater. <clears throat> is this interesting to you guys? Give me two people that say this is interesting and I'll do two more. I'll do two more. And then at the end of today, you guys are going to go, I know so much more about organic food than I did an hour ago. Okay. Organic food is better for you than non-organic. Well, there you got to give it to them. We know it's not more nutritious. It doesn't necessarily taste better, but it's better for you. Right? It's got to be. Give me organic, please. Organic food has the same nutritional value as non-organic food. Therefore, if you're eating organic chips, it's just as bad for you as if you're eating regular chips. 
That's neat, Streety. We're on the same page. Canola oil is not good for human consumption. <laughs> Extensive studies have been done on animals and humans by nutritional scientists in which they've concluded that canola oil is safe for human consumption. In fact, it is recommended by the National Heart Foundation due to its benefits relating to heart disease. We'll pick up a couple more. I got a couple more of these little other um, dietary situationals and carbohydrates and fats and stuff like that. We'll talk about those tomorrow. Okay, <laughs> but what is a canola? We'll cover those tomorrow. <clears throat> we'll get into some more myths about foods and stuff. That um, I learned a lot, to be honest. I always have this high, um, obviously organic's a smart thing to do, etc. But I don't know, man. I'm starting to wonder if it's really worth it all, unless I just grew up myself. I'm sorry for the way this light has been playing with my glasses today's show. I apologize to you. Uh, Melissa G, how much can you trust anymore? You know what I mean? Unless we're growing it ourselves. It's one of the reasons it's a great idea to either grow your own shrooms or know somebody that's doing a heck of a job and you can trust them. Okay, what did Badgie say? Badgie's always smart, so I have to go back and see what he said. You can you can get them to say anything if you're lobbyist. That's yeah, yeah. Badgie knows how that stuff works. Um, <laughs> this is going to be an interesting. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. We're going to spend about ten to twelve minutes on this. Okay. What is this right here? What is that? Well, it's a flint knife. It's a flint knife. Okay. It is, it's a flint knife. They consider that archeologically one of the first, they believed that that was a scalpel. That that was used as a scalpel. In the original, this is one of the first scalpels, they believe, that they've ever found. A scalpel. The humans have been using scalpels for a lot longer than we thought. The scalpel as we know it today came into being, wait a minute. I'm gonna say it was 1912. 1914, 1914. But let's go through, anybody wanna know just a little bit about scalpels? Bob's, <laughs> why'd you pick scalpel? Because I'm going through the lab. We're going through lab tools. Okay? Pinpointing a specific period of time when a cutting implement became the first surgical knife depends largely on perspective. Some shells with razor-like leaves were used as knives. Thumbnails were used for circumcision. Sacrificial plant stems were sometimes used. There's a guy in, a retired surgeon, and he's the curator of the historical instruments collection at the Royal College of Surgeons in England. He's been studying the history of scalpels for the last 20 years and gathering samples. He believes that the earliest 
samples of scalpels came from Paleolithic periods. And they re it revealed the use of surgical knives as early as 10,000 BC. Good morning, MVP. 10,000 BC. Blades were initially composed of flint, jade, and obsidian with specific pieces chosen for their sharp edges. Fracture and flake techniques were then employed to refine these early blades into cutting instruments with desired characteristics. Making these objects the first human refined tool. Possibly the first human refined tool was a sharpened blade for, me for um, medical purposes. A particularly well-preserved prehistoric blade mounted in a handle was found in 1991 near the Austrian-Italian border. That's the one. These tools were used for scarification, venesection, lancing, and circumcision. In fact, these instruments were still used for many of the same purposes by Alaskan natives in tribes up into the 19th century. Transition to model, modern scalpels. Metal blades replaced sharpened stones. First, it was copper. It was followed by bronze and then iron. It wasn't until 400 BC that the concept of a surgical knife was first described by, you're not gonna be surprised by this, Hippocrates. You guys know about the Hippocratic Oath, right? Physicians take the Hippocratic Oath. He used the term Macarion, which is a smaller version of a Lacedonian sword. The Macaria was a broad cutting blade with a single edge and a sharp point containing essentially the same features of the modern scalpel. Examples of Roman scalpels, 400 BC. The Romans named their version of the, of the tool, the scalpelus, which is the diminutive form of the word scalper or cutter. A scalpelus is a baby cutter, tiny cutter. With the collapse of the Roman Empire, surgical innovation flourished in the Islamic Golden Age. Surgical instruments became even more varied and specialized with the Renaissance through the 14th and 15th century. Embellishments to the scalpel <clears throat> included fixing and folding blades and specialized tips such as lancets and double-edged blades called catlins. Barbers were your original surgeons. The guy that cuts your hair was also the guy that would cut your arm off. Barbers worked during the Renaissance period they included the fathers of modern surgery, such as Guy de Chuliac and Ambrose Perret. They used ornamented scalpels with artistic features and flourishes that enjoyed wide popularity for several hundred years. These doctors got all fancy and they engraved and they flourished and they, and they put stuff on the handles of them. Here's a surgical set 
from the Revolutionary War. How do you like that hypodermic needle? Okay. Every damn thing in there is scary to... Uh, that is one scary box. I've seen the one... Oh, you should see the Civil War guy's one. It's got saws and stuff in it. Got like eight different saw blades. And that's all before... That's when you're just chewing on a rock. Keep, or keep chewing on leather. You guys remember Gillette, the Gillette um, razors, Gillette Razor Company? Gillette was the big deal back in the 19th century when he was, and he was coming along with all these patents, disposable razors, different things like that. Gillette was a big deal. Gillette was the biggest thing going, and it was until... I don't know, Gillette's still around, but they're not, they don't own the market like they did. King C. Gillette founded the American Safety Razor Company, which later became the Gillette Safety Razor Company, in 1901 to produce and market a handle and frame device that held disposable razors. That's how I grew up. I'm not kidding you. We had that, uh, the like had a little pole and it had the, the blade would sit on top and it had a sharp side on this side and a sharp side on, and you'd shave this and then you could just, I haven't seen one of those safety razors in a long time. Nothing's safe about them. Dr. Murphy envisioned an interchangeable blade although it required extra in instruments to complete that blade exchange. Yeah, that butterfly top thing, yeah. You know what I'm talking about. It. Just, oh, that's right, you would screw it. And look, here's, the, here's, um, here's the fun. <clears throat> Ted still uses it, Penny? That's great, I, I don't doubt it. Um, in 1914, Morgan Parker, a 22-year-old engineer invented the two-piece blade and handle medical scalpel that is used in ORs, uh, uh, operating rooms today. It allowed rapid mass-produced sharp blades to be used and exchanged on standard reusable handles. Where's my... An X-Acto knife is a scalpel. So use the same handle. Dispose the blade. This kid was 22 years old in 1914. And he said, hey, Doc, what if we try one of these? According to legend... Mr. Parker's uncle, a New York, New York surgeon, became impatient with the cumbersome process of the blade exchange, the old process, in his busy practice. A glance at Mr. Parker's elegant solution reveals its genius. He stated the following in its patent application. For the purpose of securing the blade to the handle, Headed studs, come on, a knurled end there. Headed studs are preferable, provided on the handle, adapted to coact with the suitable slots in the blade. When such headed stots and slots are employed, the blade may be readily secured upon the handle, and when in position, will be held so rigidly as to preclude the possibility of movement relative to the handle. It's not gonna slip out. Here is Morgan Parker's original patent. 
not too far off of what we're seeing of our regular of our regular deals now. Okay, there was more of a locks thing than a slide it in thing, but not too far off. When Mr. Parker presented his scalpel at the Clinical Congress in 1915 in Boston, Massachusetts, its reception encouraged him to make it, take it into production. Mr. Parker, who was an engineer but not a businessman, sought a partner. The first partner, listed alphabetically in the phone book under medical suppliers, was C.R. Bard. He calls up C.R. Bard. First guy in the phone book doing medical supplies. Hey, I have a plan. I have this, this instrument that I've got the, the, the patent to. Together, they formed the Bard Parker Company, which has become one of the iconic names in surgery. They developed cold sterilization to avoid superheating, which killed microorganisms. The rib-backed handle replaced those that bore the paired studs in 1936 in order to ensure one-way fitment between the blade and handle. There's a numbering system to our scalpels. And we can go on with that. Conclusion. The scalpel, since its first use as the medical knife by the Romans, has been a symbol of the surgeon. Its evolution in many ways mirrors the progress of those who were using it. Prehistoric humans used stone tools occasionally for medical uses. The barber surgeon refined techniques as they refined the instruments they were using. A sepsis demanded sweeping changes in both scalpel and surgical practices. Got to be cleaner. Sepsis. We want to be aseptic. Sepsis, sepsis is one of the ways most guys died in, world, in Civil War. They died from the disease of infection, gangrene, etc. after something had been operated on they didn't know how to keep stuff clean. They didn't understand the idea of asepsis yet. Today, the modern surgeon relies on a wide variety of technologically advanced and ever-changing equipment. Yet, the operation still begins with a scalpel, the profession's oldest instrument. That was scalpel class. <laughs> I hope you guys learned a little something with me. I probably, um, most of it's pretty basic, not pretty obvious, but it's good. It's good for us to um, revisit some of the stuff that we use. Okay? Tomorrow, what we're going to discuss at the same time like we did today, we're going to get into somebody yesterday was asking when we were talking about um, Petri plates, we're asking about slants. So, I found a couple of my old slants. I haven't been doing slants in forever. I found some old slants and some... In We're going to uh, cover slants tomorrow. Okay? We will cover slants and their use here tomorrow. We're going to spend 10 minutes on talking about doing our best. We'll do a giveaway and we'll be out of here about 10-10. Okay? Tim, was that a sharp subject? <laughs> No, no, I'm King. I don't keep uh, videos of mold. I'm sorry. Freaks me out. Wait, Niffy, today's Ava's, Ava's birthday? It is? I'll have to write to you later. I need to send her something pink. I'll figure out something pink and send it to her. Okay? <laughs> I love Ava. Action is about living fully. I was so proud yesterday after I got off um, here and I told everybody about how I had really not done my best on Monday. I shouldn't have waited to the last minute. And then on Tuesday, 
I didn't lose it and I kept my patience and I kept my poise. And I really did do my best for that whole day. And it was, my best at that point was to do nothing. Hardest thing in the world sometimes. And then the whole universe rewarded me. I told that story. And I got off yesterday and there was a lot of people replied saying, we all have to learn how to sometimes not do anything. That's nice of you guys to say happy birthday to Ava because she watches this part. Her parents will let her watch some of it. When we're not talking about stuff in Australia. How sweet of you guys. <clears throat> action. My best the other day was no action at all. You could argue no action is an action. As hard as it is to do sometimes. Action is about living fully. Inaction is the way we deny life. In action, usually you're finding some depressed and some anxious people and they're not active and they're denying their own life. You're squelching your own life forces. You have so much to give, not just to yourself, super important, but to anyone around you, anyone you ever could come in contact with. But you can't come and talk, and can't come in contact with anyone if you aren't living a life. Inaction. I might add inaction is probably our worst cancer. Matthew here, Seliger said, it's a lifestyle. I think we can be the most active people in the world, have phenomenal diets and still get cancer. Don't get me wrong. I look forward to lessening the odds. Inaction is sitting in front of the television every day for years because you're afraid to be alive and take the risk of expressing who you are. Inaction is piddling around with your business plan for two years. And by the time you're ready, that product's not even available. That product's too old to even try to sell anymore. The market passed you by. Expressing who you are. Sometimes by word and more often by deed. Those expressions, that's what taking action is. You guys are taking action right now to say happy birthday to a beautiful little girl. Guess what, it's because of that action, she's sitting there beaming. It didn't take you very much to do, did it? Think of how small some of your actions are and what you can accomplish with them. I know she is, and if you help, why wouldn't she be? A little, a beautiful little six-year-old, and she's 74 people saying happy birthday to her. Taking action. Inaction would just be, oh, it's a birthday, big deal. Expressing is taking action. You can have any great idea in your head, but what makes the difference is the action. Oh, Pops has so many brilliant ideas, I think. Has anybody, and I'm, I'm bragging here, but I'm using myself as an example, both negative and positive. You guys know I do that. I do both. I'm not the greatest thing going. Anybody ever noticed that I keep moving forward? Anybody see my IEG page this morning? You don't get those kind of things through inaction. Hold on.
We have ideas. We have plans. We have things that we want to do. And we take action. It's, it would be a sin for me. It would be a sin for me. Not everybody. A sin, remember my definition for sin? I'm shooting at something and I missed the mark. It would be a sin for me to not take action and try to grow these areas that I have plans. I can't just write a business plan and not try to do something more with it. And I gotta tell you guys something. I've probably tried five different things in the last two years. I've, I've tried five different things at least. Research this, laboratory that, license this. and none of, them have, none of them have actually brought fruit. There's no harvest from any of them. So I should stop. Right? I should just stop. If I stopped, that would be a sin. If I stop, I'm not taking action anymore. Where's our music? You can have a great many ideas in your head, but what makes the difference is the action. Without action upon an idea, there will be no manifestation, no results, no reward. A good example of this, I'm gonna spend a couple more minutes here. A good example of this comes from the story about Forrest Gump. He didn't have any great ideas but he took action. He was happy because he always did his best at whatever he did. That big old galoop. And we all watched him on the screen and go, this guy, what a goofy. And we loved him. He was always in the action. And he wasn't the best and he wasn't the brightest. Didn't have to be. He did more action than any of the rest of us. He was happy because he always did his best at whatever he, whatever he tried. He was richly rewarded without expecting any reward at all. This guy was so goofy, he didn't even know he was gonna get a reward. Taking action is being alive. It's taking the risk to go out and express your dream. This is different from imposing your dream on someone. Everyone has a right to their own dream. We don't, we don't make everyone dream our dream. Finally, Doing your best is a great habit to have. The author says, I do my best at everything. Pop says, I'm trying, I practice. I'll admit when I didn't do my best. I don't do my best at everything all the time. I do my best at a lot of things more often now than ever before. Doing my best has become a ritual in my life because I made the choice to make it a ritual. That key, the, we you, literally the whole book is done saying them one sentence. We make our rituals. We choose them. You can have a ritual 
of meanness, obstinacy, crankiness. You can have a ritual of avoid, blame, gossip. Those are all rituals we choose. You can have a ritual of showing up every day to your life with action, being impeccable, not making assumptions, not taking things personal, and you're already doing your best. It's a belief that you choose. I'm choosing the four agreements. I'm choosing them because I see them work. I make everything a ritual. And I always try to do my best. Finally, final paragraph for today. In India, they perform a ritual called puja. In this ritual, they take idols that represent God in many different forms, and they bathe them, and they feed them, and they give their love to them. They even chant little mantras to their little idols. The idol's not important. The mantra is not important. What is important is performing the ritual. And in that way, they're saying, I love you, God. The little guy, that's how they're telling them. Through action. Let's do a final giveaway. Love you guys. Get to work, practicing, doing your best. And you know what it is in every single situation. You're gonna take a 10 second break. You're gonna go, what's my best right now? That's the one I'm gonna do. Give me a number between one and 50 and I'm gonna send you guys something. Give me a number between one and 50. Everybody plays. Everybody plays this time. Give me a number between one and 50. One and 50. Give me a number between one and 50. And everybody plays. You can put up to three of them on the line at one time. Okay? Here we go. I'm looking for that number that's in the shoot. I'm looking. I'm looking. And I just saw somebody with it, but they have just recently received something from me. I'm going to pass them by. And I'm gonna wait for somebody else to get that number. I apologize, they're gonna know who they are, but I've also just, just sent them something and it was nice. So let me send this to somebody else with that number. Here we go. You're welcome, Pilar. We're looking for that number. One person's already said it, but I have to pass them by. Um, looking for that number. I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting. I wonder if I, I'm still waiting. I'm for a, a, a good number here. All righty. Melissa G. We're going to go ahead and give it to Melissa G. Mark Zamoron. You said it first. Marky Z. You said it first. I skipped by you. Melissa G. Hasn't received anything from me in quite a while. Melissa G. With the 30. Mark Zamoron. Thanks for your kindness. We'll remember you next time. But we're going to go ahead and send that to Melissa G. What are you going to send her, Pops? Thank you, Mark. Um, what are you going to send her? Well, wait till you see this. It's almost four grams. It's a little, it's, it's, it's an eighth. It's an eighth. So we're going to send that to you. Wait for it. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're also going to send you a gram of concentrate. It's extract, silly extract. So we're going to send you 
that. And Mark, thanks a lot. Appreciate your kindness too. So Melissa G, you're going to send that to me at the Detroit Mush Lab dot net. And um, let's all make sure we all spread the love here. If we've been winning, winning recently, it's okay if somebody else wins. Um, and we'll pass it around to make sure everybody gets something. All right. Have a great day, you guys. Um, I will see you guys here tomorrow. We're going to talk about slants. We're going to talk about a couple more myths that need to be exposed. And then we're going to talk about doing our best before the weekend. All right. Have a great day today. Thank you for being here, Lita and Herbie and Jackie Cat. Jackie Meow Kitty and Too Mush and Mush Mouth and Mike Barra Ball and God is Real. How much extract do you use? I personally try about a quarter of a gram, even a little bit less. That's all I need. <clears throat> extract is bomb. And the rough autograph. And uh, Melissa G, thank you. And uh, Melissa, I'd like you to thank Mark Zamoron as well. Okay, because Mark, he actually had it first. And we, we, we're, we're, we went ahead and skipped him and went straight to you. Justin Myers and Timmy. Tim Law and, Char and Sharon the Sharpie Sharperton. And Jesus Christ and Mushy. And Mark Z and JC and God is Real. And Nippy and Satter and Sharon. And Katie and Katie and Satter and Kim. And Mike and Whiskey. And Sherry Svensson. Sherry, come back tomorrow. Excuse me, come back tomorrow. We want to talk to you. God is real. How many? God is real. I take one microdose pill at a time, maybe four days, and then I don't do it for four days, and then I'll do it again. That's all. Sharon Sparks, Tumash, Jackie Cat, Tree Stump, Joel Lee, Woody K, Tim Law, Mr. McFeely, Leroy, nice to see you here this morning. Kim, SSW, God is real, Badgie. Talk to me later, but you know what, Badgie? I'm heading to Alpina. It's a, it's not looking good. So we'll figure that out. I think, Badgie, I think I want to come by. Hash bash. I'll drive by. Deborah, thank you. You're a pearl. Jesus Christ, Michael Allen, Miffy. Jackie Cat, Jimmy Max, and Cleanie, and Mushmouth, and Justin, and Mark Z, and Badgie. It's some good stuff. Penny Pack and Billy D and Herbie and Woody K and Michael Allen and Nerd Michael Patterson. Thank you, Mike. And Leroy and Cat Meowzilla and Mike and God is real. Woo! Jesus Christ, D. Anderson, SSW Page. Remember, um, God is real. It's microdose. It's 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 microdose. Page, whiskey, Mike Barball, Melissa G. Uh, uh Thank you, Mark. Yes. 5280 all day. Katie, Calico Kid. Hi, Calico. Um, God is real. Ask these questions tomorrow. I'm trying to scroll out. I love you. Satter, Summer, Woody K, Tumash, Mark Z, CCS, Justin, Mark Z, Timmy Law, Jesus Christ, and Sherry Vincent. Come on back. Melissa G, God is real. SSW Herbs, Mr. McBeely. Oh, that's thanks for telling them herbs. Summer wheat, badgie. I, I, I'm going to because I'm excited by the idea. Lil Roy, Melissa G, Jesus Christ, SSW, Mushy, I love you. Mark Z, Benny, Benny Ben, Tim Law, Pilar, Tree Stomp, Dr. Spider. That's a good one. Arachnophobia, Justin, Mark Zamorin, Free Free. I love that guy. SSW, whiskey. Everybody likes a little whiskey. Pops. Peace, kindness, practice, ouch.